Good day and welcome to the Ask the Diabetes webinar. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference to Asiato Kama. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to ASTO's national webinar on strengthening state systems to improve diabetes management and outcomes. My name is Asiato Kama, and I am a health promotion and chronic disease prevention analyst at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, and I am also joined by um, our ASTO diabetes team. We have Dr. Marcus Plesha, who's the uh, the Chief Medical Officer. Um, we also have Alicia Smith, who is the Director of Chronic Disease Prevention. Um, Talia Sands, um, who's a Senior Analyst, um, Tobacco and Chronic Disease Prevention. And then we have myself. Um, we also have the Illinois and Nevada State Team um, from the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health. We have Masako Berger, um, health Systems Program Manager, Gen Jennifer Bonk, Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Section Manager. And then from the Illinois Department of Public Health, we have Paula Jimenez, Assistant Division Chief, Division of Chronic Disease, Cara Barnett, Diabetes Project Manager, Janae Price, CDC Epidemiologist, Field Assignee, Connie Moody, Deputy Director, Office of Health Promotion. Tiffany Presley, Division Chief, Division of Chronic Disease. Cheryl Miles, Cardiovascular Health um, Program Manager. And Bradina Cole, Graduate Public Service Intern. Um, we also have um, our panelists, and they will be providing expert perspectives following the state team presentation. Um, we have Jane Myers from North Dakota, Kirsten Ayer from Oregon, Pat Schumacher from CDC, and Trish Herman from the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Welcome. Um, so today's objectives um, for this webinar are to share Illinois and Nevada's successes, challenges, and lessons learned in developing their state diabetes action plan, discuss strategies for implementing state diabetes action plans, and share AFTO's diabetes publications and resources. Um, and for the agenda today, we will start by telling you a little bit about AFTO and the Diabetes Demonstration Project, um, followed by Illinois and Nevada presentations, and then we will have a discussion with the panelists. Um, then we will share um, some of the AFTO diabetes resources and publications, and um, conclude with some final thoughts before we adjourn. So I am now going to turn it over to my colleague, Talia Sand, to tell you a little bit about ASTO and the demonstration project. Thanks, Asi. ASTO is a consensus-driven national nonprofit organization that represents the state and territorial public health agencies of the U.S., the U.S. territories and freely associated states, and the District of Columbia. Here on the screen, you can see a map of our membership. We recently celebrated our 75th anniversary, and we have three core functions. We are a leadership home for state and territorial health officials and alumni. We are an advocate and voice for state and territorial health officials on Capitol Hill. And we provide capacity building assistance to help state and territorial health officials and their leadership teams do their jobs better. Today, the project you'll hear about falls into our capacity building function. Over the last year, ASTO has led a demonstration project focusing on strengthening state systems to improve diabetes management and outcomes. We leveraged ASTO's systems change framework, which ASTO has had success with through our Million Hearts State Learning Collaborative, to support state's annual objectives to improve hypertension and control. We applied that framework to this demonstration project. Um, the demonstration project allows ASTO to provide intensive technical assistance from a team of experts, document it, and share it with public health practitioners across the country. This allows a state health agency to demonstrate an initiative's value and teaches other states how to implement a similar one. The purpose of this project was to support state health agencies and their partners 
with the development of a statewide plan that would focus on opportunities to align current efforts, address gaps, and leverage strategic partnerships to support diabetes management and improve diabetes outcomes. The states that were selected for this demonstration project are Illinois and Nevada. As mentioned, this project leveraged AFSO's framework for systems change that focuses on the key pillars necessary to create systems that are sustainable and will spread impact statewide. The levers are highlighted on your screen um, and really drove the effort that the Illinois and Nevada state teams utilized in developing their plans. We are now going to hear from the Illinois and Nevada state teams about their participation in the demonstration project and their action plan development. So to get us started, I am going to turn it over to our colleagues in Illinois to share about their work through this demonstration project. Paula and Kara, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for your participation today. I'm really pleased to present with Kara Barnett, our Diabetes Program Manager, um, to talk a little bit about the process that Illinois went through uh, regarding over the last 10 or so months uh, regarding the ASCO grant. This is what we're going to be talking about today. I'll present the burden of diabetes in Illinois and give you an introduction, kind of an overview of our action plan. And then, Kara, I will turn it over to her to uh, really kind of get into the weeds a little bit as far as strategy overview and our next steps. This slide depicts some purpose data related to prediabetes um, screening. And um, you'll see in the blue, these are the adults in Illinois who report being screened for prediabetes. And then in the orange, which I don't know, I apologize that that's showing up in green. The orange must not have shown up. Um, those are those that report having prediabetes. So 55% of adults in Illinois report being screened for prediabetes, and 8.8% reported having prediabetes. And as you all know with um, Burpus data, this is self-reported. So we know that we need to do more in this area from the aspect of increasing awareness and environmental support to make the healthy choice the easy choice, as well as offering prevention programs that are accessible and tailored to the individual's needs. This infographic shows the burden of diabetes in Illinois and it's taken from data from the ADA and also from um, Burpus data here at the department. Much of this information is not new to you. However, of interest, you can see in the upper right-hand corner are the, co the cost of diabetes in Illinois, which is um, reported to be $12.2 billion each year due to healthcare costs and reduced productivity. Also, I would like to point out in the lower left um, portion of the infographic that among Illinoisans with diabetes, about four in five reported being overweight, two in three reported high cholesterol, three in four reported high blood pressure, one in two reported smoking cigarettes, and two in five reported no physical activity. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the timeline of our um, Illinois Diabetes State Plan. So um, as Talia reported, we were awarded uh, in December of 2016. And so prior to um, us leaving for the holiday, we worked very um, long and hard hours trying to identify and convene stakeholders. So uh, we had our first stakeholder meeting in late January of 2017, where we had over 80 participants. We worked very, very hard to engage multi-sectors, where we hadn't really done this before. So it was really important that we looked at um, not just the uh, public sector partners uh, and existing partners, 
but also identifying and convening new partners as well. Um, once we had a live meeting on January 31st, then we um, broke out into work groups. These work groups met each month for two hours virtually, and um, we did, I will tell you, a very key part to our success with this project was to engage the help of a facilitator, a professional um, strategic planners who uh, helped us convene these virtual work group meetings each month. Then in May, we were able to share initial drafts of the Diabetes Action Plan, and we actually were able to share, based on the individual work groups that I'll explain in just a moment, we were able to share those with everyone and at our July meeting, which was a live meeting, which ASSO um, was able to be in attendance, we did a very interesting gallery walk where members of other work groups were able to comment on our uh, strategies and our goals. These next two slides, I just want to um, do a little shout out. This is not an inclusive list of our partners, but as you can see, we did engage many partners from both the public and the private sector. Um, and we, we could not have been successful without having very strong co-chairs uh, for our work groups and partner participation. So again, um, this is not an inclusive list, but just shows you um, some of those who uh, participated every step of the way. So. Once we met, we were able to prioritize where we wanted to concentrate the plan. And we decided on three separate work groups. These work groups included data and health information technology, and that includes le leveraging existing and new statewide systems to support data, health IT, and quality improvement. Our second work group was finance and reimbursement. This included finance and reimbursement for accredited diabetes programs that increased access and um, its goal was to reduce barriers, cultural, economic, social, physical barriers, et cetera. Our third work group was community clinical linkages, and this work group um, was formed in order to strengthen care coordination mechanisms and integrate screening tools and referral mechanisms that would incorporate health equity in clinical and community settings. So now I would like to turn it over to Kara Barnett, Diabetes Program Manager, and she will walk you through the plan. Okay. Thank you, Paula. In the past, IDPH has worked with local, state, and federal partners on diabetes under the Chronic Disease and School Health Grant, or CDASH. This is a large five-year cooperative agreement with CDC, which has helped us lay the groundwork for developing strategic partnerships and expanding the scope and reach of our diabetes efforts in Illinois. So to bring this plan together, um, as Paula mentioned, we engaged a multi-sector group of stakeholders, and we collectively identified the three priority areas, and over the course of, the seven, of seven months, developed 10 goals, 27 objectives, and more than 80 strategies. And from that, we were able to identify these five overarching goals and seven strategies that were addressed across the three priority areas. We did spend a lot of time crosswalking after we developed all these, a lot of time crosswalking and really pulling out the most important priorities, goals, and strategies. Overall, the Illinois Diabetes Plan provides a roadmap that Illinois diabetes stakeholders can use to accomplish the five goals that we have listed here, which are one, to increase knowledge, education, and awareness, establish mechanisms for referral, recruitment, and retention, test effectiveness of innovative care delivery and reimbursement models, enhance care coordination and quality, and drive policy and funding efforts. I know this slide um, is a little busy. We have a lot of text on here. We won't spend too much time on here, but I just wanted um, to draw your attention to this um, figure, which illustrates the five pillars, and they represent our five goals. You'll see that the goals mentioned before are bookend by our vision, which is at the top, which is that Illinoisans will lead healthier lives with reduced diabetes burden and disparities. 
And the core functions um, are represented there at the bottom, which are partnerships and collaboration, routine surveillance and monitoring, and stakeholder engagement um, necessary to achieve these goals and strategies. So we thought it was equally important to describe the role of IDPH. We know we can't do this alone, um, but we want to be able to provide the support and resources necessary to implement this plan. Um, so our role at IDPH is to oversee the implementation of the Diabetes Action Plan by providing uh, technical assistance, leadership, and expertise. Um, parallel to this, IDPH will work with our diabetes stakeholders um, to share information and resources, best practices, and lessons learned. Um, we'll evaluate progress um, toward achieving the plan's goals and strategies and adjust or modify those accordingly. And we'll continue to seek funding opportunities to complete the implementation of the plan. Um, and we'll talk about this in a little while, too, is that we do not receive state funds for our diabetes efforts, so we're not only looking internally for funding sources, but externally. Um, we're here to encourage stakeholder participation and collaboration and provide guidance and support for planned pilot projects. So let's take a look at our pillars. Goal one. As you can see here, is to increase knowledge, education, and awareness of diabetes across the state and to varying populations. This could be the general public, our high-risk areas, providers, um, just to name a few. There's one strategy under this goal, which is to develop a multi-component communication strategy across various groups to increase awareness of the burden of diabetes and prediabetes on vulnerable and underserved populations. So under that strategy, some of our um, objectives and action steps that we may be taking are to plan and implement a statewide public awareness campaign around diabetes that includes diabetes risk factors and diabetes prevention using a targeted, um, that are targeted towards specific demographics, and also to develop routine snapshots or reports of diabetes burden. Goal two is to establish mechanisms for referral, recruitment, and retention. Um, we have two strategies under this goal, which include um, to improve point of care service and follow-up through distribution and sharing of best practices, um, guidelines on workflow, patient screening, testing, referral, and reimbursement models. Some of our action steps under this um, strategy will be to identify existing data sources, um, for example, um, EHRs and tools on individual social determinants of health that impact program referral and recruitment, retention and completion, and um, identify evidence-based tools and processes that categorize readiness and barriers to change. Our strategy, too, is to develop a pilot to process, to assess the social determinants of health and readiness, barriers to change for people with diabetes, pre-diabetes that would benefit from access to community resources. Um, some of the action steps that we have under the strategy are to develop and disseminate a business case to employers and insurers on the benefits of incentivizing evidence-based diabetes prevention and self-management programs. Also to develop a set of recommendations of systems, processes, and tools for diabetes referral. And also develop and pilot a referral system framework. Okay, now on to goal three. It's to test innovative care delivery and reimbursement models. There's also one strategy under this goal. Um, it is to increase access to community-based diabetes prevention and treatment programs through traditional and non-traditional delivery models. And this is part of um, one of the things in our plan is that we're going to be looking for innovative ways to do these things. Um, some of the objectives and action steps that are included in goal three are to identify evidence-based care delivery models and practices that show improved reach, participation outcomes, access to care, and reduction in health disparities, and to test various delivery and reimbursement models for diabetes prevention and self-management. Goal four is to enhance care coordination, and we've listed two strategies under this goal. This goal is a little different from goal one in the fact that this goal is geared more specifically to providers. So strategy one is to improve care coordination through the development of data sharing or practice agreements 
diabetes program and resource database, and public-private partnerships. Some of our objectives and action steps that we plan to take under this strategy will be to establish a comprehensive data sharing framework and pilot across various sectors, and ensuring that we meet industry standards and legal requirements. Strategy two is to educate health systems and providers on the importance of developing and or implementing policies, processes, and tools that support and are in alignment with diabetes standards of care and improved quality. Some of our action steps under this strategy include improving diabetes quality of care by utilizing and promoting ADA, AADE standards of care to clinical providers and healthcare teams. Um, also to identify diabetes quality measures, tools, and processes used to meet national reporting requirements. Um, and develop and communicate recommendations for diabetes quality standards, tools, and process to stakeholders. And goal five is, last but not least, <laughs> drive policy and funding efforts. Um, we only have one strategy under this goal, but we understand this is one of the largest goals to undertake. Um, the, strategy, the strategy is to strengthen and identify funding opportunities, to drive policy, to fund and sustain diabetes, diabetes efforts by advocating for reimbursement by all payers and promoting employer and insurance-based incentives, participate in diabetes prevention and self-management programs. Under this, we have quite a few objectives and um, action steps that we would like to take. Some of them include creating and disseminating to payers a business case, um, tools, evidence, and resources for reimbursement of diabetes prevention and self-management programs. Also to establish policy for reimbursement of diabetes prevention and self-management programs among all Illinois Medicaid programs, um, and also educating policymakers on evidence-based approaches to reduce the burden of diabetes in Illinois and the need to provide sustainable funding for those efforts. Our goal is really to get this information out in front of um, policymakers and start opening the lines of communications with them and letting them know um, what needs to be done. As I mentioned before, we don't receive any state funding for our diabetes efforts in Illinois. So what have we done to market the plan since the planning process is wrapped up? We've developed the executive summary, um, which is attached in the files here, um, to disseminate amongst diabetes stakeholders in Illinois. Um, right now, we're working on revamping the plan so it's more user-friendly for citizens and also policymakers. And as I mentioned before, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we did attend on November 8th an Education and Awareness Day at the state capitol um, to see, speak to policymakers about the burden of diabetes in Illinois and also to promote our diabetes action plan. And then on November 14th, there was um, an event at the Blue Cross Blue Shield building up in Chicago, and our director did speak about the burden of diabetes in Illinois and also um, was up there to promote our new Diabetes Action Plan. Um, we continue to engage our core team by consulting them and seeking feedback on the plan. And we spoke to the American Association of Diabetes Educators at their symposium and conducted a gallery walk to gain knowledge on how our partners can help implement the diabetes plan. Um, and along with our other partners, we continue to promote diabetes self-management trainings. Um, so what are our next steps? Um, we are going to continue to enhance our partnerships and continue to open up the lines of communication with diabetes stakeholders in Illinois. We plan to manage performance through monitoring and evaluation, and we will continue to look um, to gain buy-in from multi-sectors. Um, at this time, that is what, um, our presentation, and we will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kara and Paula. That was excellent. Very exciting to see how far you have come in such a short amount of time and some of the exciting traction you've already had in your state with launching this plan. We'll look forward to hearing how it goes as you continue on the path of implementation. With that, I am now going to pass it over to the Nevada team to share about their experience in the demonstration project. 
So, Ms. Sacco, if you would, we will turn it over to you. Great. Um, my name is Ms. Sacco Borger, and I'm a health systems manager at Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, first, I would like to um, go over the burden of di diabetes in Nevada by showing some statistics. So in Nevada, we have a prevalence of diabetes at 9.7%, uh, and then uh, we ex estimate that 8.8% .8 of adults have di pre-diabetes. However, um, we are aware that these numbers are self-reported, and especially pre-diabetes, uh, we do know that 80 to 90 percent of the adults who have prediabetes don't know about it, so the actual number would probably be higher. And then um, I wanted to, uh, when we were creating this uh, diabetes action plan with ASHTO, we did an extensive uh, review of literature as well as our report and uh, data that we had available, and we identified uh, three populations that, um, especially that had a uh, higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And uh, we realized that 16% of adults in rural and frontier counties um, have diabetes. And um, in Nevada, uh, we have two urban areas, one down in the, uh, in the south, uh, Cloud County, Las Vegas, Henderson area. And in north, we have Reno, Sparks, Carson area. Uh, uh, two of them are urban. Um, within the state of Nevada, we have 17 counties, and then 14 out of, out of 70, 17 counties are considered front and uh, rural and frontier counties. So uh, within our state, uh, things are kind of spread out, and um, we believe uh, with the shortage of primary care providers in Nevada, um, we do realize that people living in rural areas have uh, difficulty accessing the health care. And in terms of uh, some demographic uh, groups, um, uh, we realize that African Americans living in Nevada have higher prevalence as well as uh, adults older than 65. And um, when we were analyzing our data, uh, we also identified some risk factors associated with type 2 diabetes, which um, includes um, like stuff like hypertension, smoking, and also income level. But we also wanted to highlight that the data that I showed um, the association between diabetes and uh, food security. And in, in fact, in the um, state of Nevada, we are trying to, uh, we have developed the, uh, the nutrition unit um, as well as Office of Food Security. So we wanted to make sure that we collaborate closely with uh, the group of nutritionists in the state of Nevada. We also uh, identified the depression to be an um, underlying factor when it comes down to control and management of type 2 diabetes. Um, so when we hold, uh, when we are working on ASTRO team and uh, holding in-person meetings to discuss action plan, we wanted to make sure that we invite people working um, uh, in the area of mental health as well. And here's our brief timeline on how we uh, developed our diabetes action plan. Um, around February, we started talking with our stakeholders, um, including IDU committee. Um, IDU stands for Improving Diabetes and Obesity Outcomes. And um, IDU committee is a not-for-profit organization and as they consist of uh, stakeholders throughout Nevada interested in working towards addressing um, towards outcomes on uh, diabetes and obesity. And then they do such a great job, and then they bring a lot of different uh, stakeholders together um, and then hold uh, monthly meetings and they discuss important policies and interventions. And... Um, in March, uh, we held the first in-person stakeholder meeting in Las Vegas, which we included, uh, we invited over 50 stakeholders, and um, we identified four buckets that we wanted to focus on, which I would go over it more closely later. 
but we divided um, our stakeholders into four different groups and had extensive discussions on um, deciding what goals that we should focus within each pillow, as well as more specific um, action uh, items that we, can, we should work on. And then in April and May, uh, we met through webinars and virtual meetings with Astro team and stakeholders in Nevada. And in June, we held another uh, in-person stakeholder meeting in North uh, Reno, Nevada. And then in August, we finalized, uh, uh, finalized the action plan. And then in September, we started our dissemination process. And then um, I apologize, it's a little tiny, On it might be too tiny to read through on the screen, but uh, these are the stakeholders that have been invited to those two in-person meetings. Uh, we invited local health districts, which include Washoe County and the Southern Nevada Health Districts, Carson City Health and Human Services. We also invited Elko County um, School Districts, we also invited community coalitions. Um, since the rural counties don't have um, the health districts per se, but they do have a, a very strong community coalition, so we invited nine county uh, community coalitions, as well as a uh, um, PACE uh, coalition in Elka County. We also invited um, medical hospitals, uh, acute care hospitals, uh, both from the north and um, South, um, as well as rural hospitals, facilities, and then um, we also had representatives from federally qualified health centers and the community clinics. Uh, universities also played a, a strong role. Uh, they have um, Project ECHO uh, at the University of Nevada, Reno, which they focus on uh, educating primary care physicians um, including diabetes is issues, so um, they came to the, our meetings. We also had a wide uh, variety of state agencies to represent during the meeting, including state uh, WIC office, Office of Food Security, Obesity Prevention Program, Community Health Workers Program, SNAP-Ed, and Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention Program. And uh, community organizations, uh, we invited Food Bank of Northern Nevada, uh, Three Square Food Bank, Health Insights, which is uh, Nevada's quality improvement organization. We have presented from uh, Primary Care Association, um, Nevada Business Group on Health, which uh, they work with over 50 uh, employers in Nevada. And then we also had Education Quality Living, um, in terms of the insurance payers, we had a representative from Nevada Medicaid, Public Employee Benefit Program, United Healthcare, Anthem, and Merit Group. And um, there are um, other organizations, but um, these are the main ones that we um, worked with during the in-person meetings. And uh, these are the four buckets that we decided to focus on. Um, and they include prevention, screening and early identification, treatment and disease management, and the surveillance and data. And then under each bucket, we decided to have um, one to two goals for each pillar. Um, when we had the first in-person meeting, uh, we had a lot of great ideas for each bucket, so it was really hard for us to narrow it down. But at the same time, we wanted to um, make that plan simple enough so that we can implement it. And um, when we narrowed it down, we also made it made sure that we incorporated um, the input from our stakeholders by communicating through um, virtual meetings and emails. And then so this is an example um, of what the actual plan would look like. So under prevention, we have a goal to increase access to evidence-based lifestyle change DPPs available across Nevada by increasing the number of DPP workshops offered by 10% annually. 
And under each goal, we um, had very specific action steps that we can implement. And then for each action step, uh, we identified the evaluation measures and potential data sources so we can track on a progress and evaluate it later. And I'm going to move on to the dissemination. Um, in September, we attended the Nevada Business Group on, on Health Annual Meetings. It was kind of like a conference where a lot of our stakeholders also attended. So we disseminated the printed version. It was kind of like a laminated printed version of um, our action plan and then uh, uh, di distributed to our partners. We also attend um, I do monthly meetings, uh, which uh, Dr. Reeves from Health Insight does a great job bringing uh, stakeholders. So I would jump in and then uh, uh, give updates on what's going on with Astro Demonstration Project as well as other diabetes-related issues that is happening. And then Nevada Public Health Association Conference was also held in Reno in September, in September 2017. Um, so I attended that and then um, we did a presentation on our effort around diabetes. And then we have Quality Technical Assistance Center, which we call it QTAC. And uh, QTAC is run by St. Rose Dominican Hospital Dignity Health down in Las Vegas. And then they are kind of like a go-to organization where they take a lead on uh, implementation of DSME and DPP, as well as train the trainers. So I attended the advisory counseling meeting, which happens every quarter, and also gave them an update on uh, what is going on with the action plan. And for Nevada, the next steps, um, apparently Nevada was chosen for a 618 uh, initiative to uh, expand the access on National Diabetes Prevention Program. So that timing was great because the momentum through uh, the Astro Demonstration Project um, that we gained was already there. So it was a great addition to our uh, work. And then uh, we started holding a monthly meeting with Nevada Medicaid to talk about um, the issues around diabetes prevention, as well as the potential steps that we can take to um, move the needle towards policy change, and then especially the coverage around national diabetes prevention programs. We also attend a uh, biweekly meeting with Nutrition Unit. Um, nutrition Unit include the statewide uh, uh, WIC office, SNAP Ed, and Office of Food Security. And um, we've been discussing the ways that we can potentially collaborate to combat uh, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in Nevada, and which has been fantastic. And I really strongly do uh, believe that our um, relationship with them was enhanced after after the um, in-person meeting that held in Las Vegas because they also did come to those meetings. And then in January next month, um, my supervisor, uh, Jenny Bong, a chronic disease uh, director, and I will be attending a quarterly meeting um, and then present at the, uh, the meeting for the managed care organization and uh, kind of like update them or educate them what is going on um, under diabetes program as well as national diabetes prevention program. So I'm really looking forward to it. And finally, um, we started working with CDC and ACDC um, to hold a state, uh, state engagement meeting in February 2018 to bring our stakeholders together again to uh, talk about the Pacific uh, implementation plan of this action plan. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. And here is the, um, the uh, 618, what we do to prevent type 2 diabetes. 
um, which Nevada is working on currently to expand the access to the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And then um, some of the key successes that I wanted to emphasize, um, obviously we are able to um, uh, come up with a really nice extensive um, diabetes action plan for the next three years. So that was great. And um, I was really uh, impressed to see over 50 partners throughout Nevada come together and talk about um, issues related to diabetes and then um, develop this uh, action plan. Um, I really do think the diabetes program has a very strong social capital that brings in. Um, I, it, it's probably part of it is that um, in Nevada, diabetes program has been around for close to 10 years, I believe. So that's probably part of it, but um, I was really happy to see all the stakeholders come together for um, diabetes. And then um, the opportunity that we gained uh, by working with CDC and NACDD to hold uh, the state engagement meeting um, is, I believe that is a big success for us too, so that we can talk about the next steps and then uh, the uh, specific implementation plan for the action plan. And then for lesson learned, um, we are always looking for the funding for implementation. Um, Within the state of Nevada, we don't have the state uh, funding supporting the diabetes program at this point. So uh, not just internally, but as well as ex externally, we are always looking for the funding. And then for the data, um, uh, data collection for statewide surveillance on diabetes, we do have a BRFSS data available to us, but um, as we all know, it is a self-reported data. So. Um, we are trying to come up with an innovative way to collect the data. Um, in, in Nevada, we do have one um, health information exchange, but it is in the repository format platform, so it's not really for the use of public health. So we are trying to come up with an innovative way in the future um, to track on these numbers. And then um, we believe um, it is extremely important for us to engage policymakers and legislatures in the future. Uh, in the state of Nevada, we have biannual legislative sessions, and we just had one in 2017, so the next one is going to be 2019. So um, we're starting to talk about uh, how we are going to create the white paper and all that um, information right now, um, starting to early. So um, I think it's going to help to engage them in the future as well. And these are the references for some of the data that I uh, shared today. And that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Misako. That was wonderful and great to hear about the synergies and momentum that you're carrying forward, as well as the strengthened relationships that you've made with partners across the state and within your own agency. So thank you. And thanks again to the Illinois team and to the Nevada team for your hard work and your presentation. Congratulations on your plans, and we are very excited to see them go into implementation in the months to come. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Alicia Smith, to kick off a discussion about these wonderful presentations. Thank you, Talia, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today, and um, thank you to Illinois and Nevada for your wonderful presentations. Um, I'll now invite uh, our panelists to join us. Um, you all could start your webcams um, so that we could see you, um, and then I think we also have um, uh, photos as well to show during the discussion. Um, so I'll uh, turn it over first um, to our colleagues um, in North Dakota and in Oregon to speak to us um, shortly on what you've been doing regarding the implementation of some of your goals um, and then any remarks that you might have on ways that Nevada and Illinois can implement some of the goals that they've outlined um, on their plans today. So um, I'll first turn it over um, to Ms. Jane Myers. 
Hi, everybody. Um, hoping you all can hear me. And um, I am really honored to be with you here today and to hear your presentations. Uh, presentations from Illinois and Nevada it just is evident how much work um, and effort has gone into developing these plans and all of the partnerships that you all have um, put together. And on that note, I will just say that um, as in Illinois and Nevada, I think that has been one of the strategic things that we have worked on here in North Dakota is partner development um, because we all know that um, things don't happen in a vacuum and you have to work you know, with your people in order to get things accomplished. Um, I um, was going to just comment a little bit about each plan for Illinois. Um, I thought that your priorities that you came up with data and health information technology, finance and reimbursement and community and clinical linkages, those are very those are very key um, priority to have. Um, and I wondered, you know, as you work on your technology, et cetera, um, you know, if you can comment a little bit about your uh, electronic health record referrals for DPP and, and um, DSME, whether or not you're working towards something um, along that line to help facilitate um, utilization of those programs. And um, one thing that I am going to be investigating here in North Dakota and that I thought might be a tip for you there as well is um, if you have an opportunity to work with your clinic managers as a mechanism for, you know, doing sort of uh, that broad spectrum um, networking. And so, you know, for example, in North Dakota, and, I, and again, I'm just speaking from a North Dakota standpoint, that in North Dakota, it's, it's the clinic managers that have a significant role in how um, the workflow occurs within those clinic systems. And so when you talk about um, establishing uh, mechanisms for recur, uh, referral, recruitment, and retention, it just seems to me that reaching out to those people um, in your state as well would be a good thought, something for you to investigate. Um, I also was going to mention that I really am very pleased with quite a few of the things that are in the Prevent Diabetes Stat Toolkit, and I know that they're going to talk about toolkits a little bit later, so I'll just I'll leave that portion of it there. Um, I better keep an eye on my time here. I think I have seven minutes. So um, in I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about Nevada just for a moment. Um, with regard to Nevada's plan, again, beautiful plan, and I just appreciate so much all of the work that you've done into it, and it looks like you obviously have a lot of really good things going on in your state. But with regard to your uh, prevention goal, I wondered when it comes to training your lifestyle coaches, uh, whether or not you have thought about uh, keeping sort of a – an ongoing, like a tracking mechanism of who all is being trained, uh, and then also where do they plan to implement their skills? Where are they going to be, you know, facilitating programs? And if you can look regionally within your state and, and think about networks for those lifestyle coaches so that they can reach out to each other and, and work together, we have found that to be very useful and successful in North Dakota within some of our larger areas that um, if the lifestyle coaches do actively work together, then they share resources, they help each other out with their with their groups, their cohorts, et cetera. And so that's one thing that um, I would recommend. Um, I don't actually have a formal strategy for doing that. Other than that, we have a couple of master trainers in North Dakota, and every time they have um, a training, then I ask them to just forward me the contact information for their lifestyle coaches. And if I, um, if I can also have them assess a little bit what they know about, you know, where these people are planning to practice. It's just something helpful to do. Um, let's see what's here. In regard to the screening and early identification goal, your, your second action step is encourage providers to include questions on intake forms regarding food insecurity, depression, et cetera. I was just wondering about your process in relation to that, you know, what are your plans for actually implementing that, the nuts and bolts of it, so to speak. And then um, action step number five is engaging community health workers, aka promotories at the community level. And so I just wondered about the scope of practice for those people in your state. How are you addressing that, or are you going the strict, 
uh, stay strictly with a, a paper and pencil screening just using the CDC risk test. Um, wondering if that was what you meant by, by that particular part of it. And I had a note too about the treatment and disease management goals. Um, I wondered about your support for DSME providers, and I'll just share that in North Dakota, we really do work hard on, on supporting our lifestyle coaches and our educators. Um, and um, we have a diabetes coalition and that um, the Department of Health works collaboratively with the coalition to provide continue, continuing education opportunities for them. We have a diabetes summit and, for example, this year we're going to have um, in excess of 15 credits at, at our summit. Um, and we try to tailor educational opportunities not only for the lifestyle coaches but also for the DSME providers at that same symposium and we try to get them to talk to each other because what we really would love is that marriage between, you know, the community, community sites as well as the clinical sites, so supporting those community and clinical linkages. So anyway, that was just a thought. So I think I'm going to end there. I'm sure that I'm probably, if not over, I'm close to it. So thank you. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, I'll now turn it over to Kirsten. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It was, uh, or it is great to be here, and I really applaud the effort of Illinois and Nevada. They, I mean, what promising and really just solid partnership engagement processes that you both went through and clearly reflect uh, what your states and communities are looking for around improving diabetes. Uh, some of the things that I heard that that we have have experienced and are still in the process of learning about really kind of tie in also from an Illinois perspective around the IT and some of the things that we have been challenged with and have been trying to figure out how to overcome are when you become reliant on community-based organizations to provide, to be a provider, if you will, a kind of non-traditional provider. Uh, how how do you really shore up those community clinical linkages and get those closed-loop referrals so uh, clinicians feel comfortable referring to programs outside of their clinic offices, and then that that communication can come back. And so we've been doing a lot around building out electronic health records, web interfaces, and data use sharing agreements so that these entities can communicate and kind of close that loop, if you will, and then thinking about the importance of the ease of that so our community partners are successful, which we have learned has been so important in assuring culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate language delivery or program delivery, um, just because some of these organizations that do a lot of support um, for um, Asian Americans or uh, Alaska Natives and American Indians or African Americans or our immigrant populations, these are small organizations. They are really not attuned to being those um, payers and, and that part of the provider network. And so we have had to invest a lot in both IT support and in a lot in technical assistance to help bring them up to be ready for Medicare rollout as providers. Um, so, and that's a tip also for Nevada. That has been a learning curve for us, and it has taken us a lot longer than we anticipated, and we're still working on it and getting community partners prepared for being a Medicare provider, and we're working on getting it to be Medicaid approved as well. And so we're really needing to demonstrate to our payers that this can be managed at a community level. And so what does it look like to have those contractors that are providing PA and support and IT support as well? Um, I think some of the other things that really stood out is that importance of those multi-sector uh, collaborations and partnerships. And I, I think one of the things that um, we have really learned here is that diabetes gets best managed when it leaves the four clinic walls. And so how do we help create communities that have people who are pre-diabetic or who have diabetes be successful in the management of their diabetes? And so that really is dependent on us working not just within our diabetes partnerships, uh, but across chronic diseases and really taking an integrated approach. Uh, diabetes has proven to be a wonderful disease that people, not wonderful from the sense of having it stinks, but wonderful from the perspective of there's a lot of people who care about it and want to do something about it, and it brings people together, which you all saw demonstrated in your action planning. 
It also is a segue to help us talk about physical activity, nutrition, obesity, heart disease, tobacco use, and how to do that in an integrated fashion. And so for us here in Oregon, diabetes was a conversation that our legislators wanted to have, and they formed a caucus around it. And then what ended up resulting is a transition to thinking about how you have a chronic disease caucus. Um, because really all the issues we want to talk about for diabetes prevention and self-management are really important for a number of other issues. And so how do you leverage that interest for getting real change uh, and real health outcomes? Um, so that's something to think about as well, is not just thinking about multi-sector, but really multi-risk factor and, and diseases. Um, and then I think something else that it, it appears that you're all touching on, which is so exciting, and I just encourage us all to talk about it more, is that these are health issues that are impacting older adults. And that important conversation that public health has with our um, aging partners, whether it's our state units on aging, whether it's our local area agencies on aging, these are key collaborators, both in being very successful at getting people into programs that help them take charge of their health, um, but also being um, good resources in rural parts of our country. They're present and they're there, and, and sometimes in a way that's more meaningful even than local public health. So uh, I think really turning to our local area agencies on aging can be so important for these kind of um, self-management and, and um, programs where we're trying to help people take charge of, charge of their health. Uh, and then just lastly, which seems to touch on both what Illinois and Nevada are doing is, is we're reaching out to your QIOs, those entities in your state who are responsible for helping quality improvement initiatives in clinics for Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, they're, they're doing a lot of this stuff that we don't need to do. We, public health doesn't need to use our very precious resources to do some of these things, but how do we tie them up and make sure that we're working across a coordinated fashion and we're part of the conversations and seen as a resource, but not having to use our own limited resources uh, in, the, in doing some of these things because others are out there working on this. And I heard Health, health Insight, they are our QIO here in Oregon, and they have been an instrumental partner in working on diabetes, uh, self-management and diabetes prevention. Um, and then lastly, I guess I, I, I can't not and state this enough, and I saw it touched on in the Nevada plan, um, we really need comprehensive funding for obesity, chronic disease prevention. And uh, without that, we are going to continue to put band-aids on problems. And so thinking of those funding strategies, not just to, to fund the benefits, but to truly fund upstream prevention of these diseases are critical. And there are some um, key partners out there who can really help us with that conversation and, and what those good strategies are. And it seems like both of you are very on track for, for doing that. So. Seems like we're all working towards the same goal, and I really look forward to learning from you all uh, on what bumps you hit and, and where we can uh, learn together. So, thanks. Wow, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for your wonderful remarks. Um, lots of good nuggets of um, information there. Um, I'll give an opportunity for um, Illinois and Nevada to respond to some of those remarks as well as any questions we get into the chat box. But before I do that, um, I also want to give an opportunity for our other two partners um, to speak on what they've done with communities on diabetes and make any remarks on ways that Nevada and Illinois can implement um, some of the goals that they've outlined in their plan. So I'll first uh, turn to uh, Pat Schumacher. Um, who is the chief program implement chief of the program and program implementation branch um, at CDC Division of Diabetes Translation? Pat, thank you. And I know um, I think we're about at time, so I'm going to try to keep my my remarks um, pretty brief. Um, also, big big congrats both to Nevada and to Illinois. Um, we know how much work goes into developing a statewide diabetes action plan, so kudos to both of you. Um, as I was kind of reflecting on this call and thinking about, you know, after years of working really closely with states on developing and implementing diabetes um, plans, 
I was thinking about kind of what are some of the lessons learned or the takeaways um, from doing that, and especially focusing on implementation because I think the the implementation piece is just really key. Sometimes we we spend and rightly so we spend a lot of time and energy on developing the plan and thinking about the partners and their involvement in developing the plan, writing the plan, um, all of those um, all of those steps which are really really critical. But sometimes um, implementation kind of gets pushed aside or saved for later um, or kind of put on the back burner. So in thinking about those states that have been really, really successful, not only in developing a plan but then in actually moving it forward, um, I could say, I guess, three things that I just want to leave you with. One is really if you're a state and you're thinking or, or, or getting started in the planning process, really thinking about implementation on the front end. As you're thinking about developing your plan, um, be kind of devoting equal time to thinking about what will the implementation phase look like? Um, what is that process going to be? Who's going to be involved in that? And be as clear as you can in kind of framing that because you don't want to lose your partners in the process. Hopefully they're going to help you implement that plan and so involving them on the front end and making it clear on the front end, our goal is not just developing this plan and putting it out there. Our goal is really developing this plan and then moving it forward in our state, and we're going to need your help to do that. I think that's a really, really important message. And the states that I've seen do that have been successful in keeping those partners engaged. Um, the second point I just want to make is getting that partner commitment. Um, and I've seen states actually use, in some cases, partner commitment forms, where basically they're asking people to, to make a commitment to sign up um, to work on, a, on implementing a specific strategy or um, action item in the plan. And I think that really there's something about signing a document that really, really helps increase accountability. And it, the partner is basically signing up to say, yes, you know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to commit, um, you know, time and resources to doing this. And that goes a long way, and that also helps clarify for them what they're signing up for. And then finally, just kind of keeping this realistic and doable, because sometimes a statewide plan can be huge, and it can be overwhelming. And Sometimes you, you develop your plan and you're sitting there and you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh my gosh, where are we going to start? And so um, a couple of you mentioned, you know, the importance of work groups, and I think that's key. But keeping them small and focused and action-oriented and really centered around some key areas of the plan that you want to move forward on. And remember, you know, sometimes you don't have to move forward on everything all at once. Um, it can be very meaningful to pick a few key areas and form a, a few small work groups to move forward in those areas. That helps keep things um, focused, keeps people from being overwhelmed, and also really makes it clear on what you're doing and what you want to accomplish in the next year. Um, and I think also as partners kind of see that the groups are doing something, and they're actually ticking things off the list, and they're getting things accomplished, and they're putting things in place, and momentum is, is continuing forward. That's energizing in itself, and I think you're much more likely to keep your partners engaged by having those small wins. Um, sometimes they, they can be, you know, smaller things, but they're, they're accomplished, and they're helping you move forward toward a larger goal. So I think those are just so important. But again, um, I just want to thank you both. We're excited that Nevada is having a state partner engagement meeting around the National Diabetes Prevention Program coming up here in February. I think that's a great next step um, resulting from all of this work you've done with your partners and those relationships you've built. So we're excited to be working with you on that. Um, and just, again, congratulations. Um, we're, we're glad to be a part of this. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, those were extremely insightful. Um, I'll now turn it over uh, for Trish Herman, who's a consultant with the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, to share some remarks as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here, and it's um, very exciting 
And I also want to offer my congratulations to the state teams, Illinois and Nevada, um, for all of the work that you've done with your partners over the past year. It's really um, exciting to see. I know that your partners are probably energized by your plans um, and your leadership in taking action. So it's, it's really nice to see that you, you have your, fi your plans final. Um, and now as you're turning towards implementation of your plans, to continuing to work with those partners is going to be really imperative. So I just want to share a couple of points, and this is really from my perspective of working with states on de uh, developing and implementing action plans, mainly focused on diabetes prevention. I'd um, just like to offer kind of two thoughts um, that are really tenets of collective impact. Um, and so for collective impact is a, is a framework. Um, it's very high level, probably uh, it's simplistic, but it, it's useful to think about as you're working with partners uh, to think about this. The premise really is that no single policy or a government um, agency or organization or one nonprofit or, or program can really um, solve these complex social problems like diabetes and all of the, the challenges we face with management and prevention of diabetes. That the approach really calls for that everybody um, needs to be working together and from the different sectors to really uh, work on a collective common agenda that has shared me measurement in aligning your efforts. So there's five kind of different areas, but I just want to talk about two of them. And um, before I do, I just also want to acknowledge exactly what Pat said. Um, I completely agree with that. It can be overwhelming to look at your plans. You have so much in there. They're really comprehensive that think about what your current resources are and really prioritize um, areas of the plan. You might delay other um, areas. You might wait a year. You might ask a partner to take it on. Um, but just really considering taking on a, a one or two priority or strategies um, as opposed to t tackling it all at once. Um, so uh, getting back to the collective impact, um, the first one is really, and I think you guys are, are doing this really well and have thought about this from the get-go, is really thinking about um, the tenant itself is a backbone organization with staff a specific, a, with a specific set of skills to serve the entire initiative and coordinate participating organizations and agencies. So I loved um, Illinois' slide that really outlined what the role of the state health department is. I thought you, got, you guys were doing a great job spelling it out there for your partners to see how you are going to be moving forward with this plan. Um, Nevada, you'll be thinking, what is your role as the state health department? Are you taking on part of it, some of it? Um, what are the roles of your partners? How does your current um, partnership structure uh, support the implementation of your priorities in the action plan? Um, are there adjustments that need to be made uh, with your current partnership structure that could really support the plan implementation? A lot of states, um, as they're working on diabetes prevention action plans, may already have a current uh, diabetes coalition or a network, and they kind of tweak that a little bit so that it fits um, implementation of the plan, and they let the partners know, you know, the reasoning why we're going to, this work group is going to change into a, you know, a coverage work group to take on a different area um, to, to move forward with that implementation. Um, so uh, you guys, I know, are off to a great start in thinking about, um, about that work. The second item is about um, communication. And you know, the tenant is really just about the open and continuous communication that's needed across uh, many players. And you're really, it's needed to build trust, to assure mutual objectives, and create common motivation. So I love um, Nevada, how you talked about, your, it, to me it was almost like your road show. You went to your business group on health, you went to the Nevada Public Health Association, you're sharing the plan, what's in it. Um, I think that's really important to celebrate <laughs> that you have the plan and make sure that partners know that this is how you're moving forward and that your work is going to align with this plan um, as, you, as you move forward. Um, so I would, you know, some states have engaged their communications departments um, so that they can help spread the word about the plan. They have hosted kickoff events uh, that they bring all the partners back together. And really, it's about celebrating, you know, for a moment, because we don't do that often enough to celebrate the successes. You have a plan. You know the direction you're going in. Uh, so bringing everyone together to talk about that. And then some states have created communication tools because the plans can be so large and overwhelming if you're, if you're engaging, per se, um, a new partner perhaps, that they've kind of uh, created a small FAQ or a fact sheet 
or um, a sample PowerPoint presentation that a partner could use to engage people or some type of infographic, something that's more of a snapshot. And I know Nevada, you have done, I'm sorry, Illinois has done that with their summary document that's made it um, more manageable and digestible. So just kudos to you all. I think both of these, you are all doing um, these tenants, you're, but you're all are thinking about and and utilizing this. So I, I feel like I'm preaching through the prior a little bit, but it's just important to remind going forward. One last I, item I just want to um, mention is um, some of the policy implica impl uh, implications in your plans. I know um, Illinois, you had uh, policy options around coverage, and um, just wanted to remind everyone that NACDD is here to help you with any policy analysis or policy plans as you move forward with that work, um, and that in addition, um, most of you may be aware or maybe not that NACDD, in partnership with CDC and Levitt Partners, launched last spring a National Diabetes Prevention Program Toolkit. And you can access that toolkit at nationaldptcoveragetoolkit.org. And the toolkit really has valuable information and resources um, that health plans, employers, Medicaid agencies are going to need to know as they're going through the process of trying to obtain coverage. It's not like a button is switched and off you go. It's There's things that you have to consider, such as contracting. How are you going to deliver the program, the billing and coding, um, data and reporting, um, all those things that an employer or Medicaid agency has to consider. And I know uh, Kirsten on the, <laughs> the call knows this all very well since she's um, part of that, that project. Um, so I, I think those were my comments, and I, again, I just congratulate you all for, for doing this great work and your leadership in making this happen, and uh, I'm just glad to be um, have the opportunity to be here with you all today, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about your successes in the future. Thanks. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All of your comments were just so insightful. Um, before we wrap up this portion um, of our webinar, I actually want to kick it back over um, to the folks in Illinois and Nevada to see what remarks they might have um, for your comments. And then also just a reminder to everyone who's on the call um, that if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share, please um, populate those directly into the chat box. Um, and, and we'll uh, facilitate uh, responses for those things. But I'll first turn to Illinois to see if there was anything you heard from the panelists you'd like to respond to. Hi, thank you so much. And um, both Kara and I were writing fast and furiously. Um, so I, I think I'll start with Jane's comments. Um, regarding um, referral, recruitment, and retention. I know we, we have a long way to go in this arena, but we did concentrate a lot of our educational op opportunities, both um, with webinars and with live meetings. Um, um, we also have a diabetes coalition. We do a diabetes symposium, and so we um, are, are always and continuously hearing from um, healthcare uh, providers all over the state of the need um, for better referral systems in Illinois. So I know that that's really what we're going to be concentrating on. Um, Kirsten, um, something that you said really resonated with us, and that is that diabetes is best managed outside the clinic walls. Um, we, re we realize that we will work towards, I mean, I, I mean, it's just becoming more and more apparent to us that um, we really have to look at some um, integrated approaches um, for diabetes prevention. Um, Pat, I've, I'm like was writing like crazy when you were speaking and giving suggestions. And I think one thing that we really like, you said you had three things regarding implementation. And I love your idea of getting partner commitment, of getting the stakeholders to sign up and maybe implement an action item in the plan. I really think that that's something that um, we will concentrate on when we have our kickoff meeting next month in January. So um, thank you for that. And then Trish, um, you know, again, just excellent, excellent ideas. Um, I, I, will probably, you know, we will definitely 
try to concentrate on just one to two strategies. You know, we do have a massive plan. Um, we have, um, you know, a lot to do. And I think that by concentrating initially on one or two strategies so that we can show success is really, really key um, in keeping our partners engaged. And also, we do have plans to communicate very regularly um, to keep that engagement. Um, also, you know, that we'll continue to, to work um, with various agencies, um, your comments on the policy implications um, and assistance from NACDD. Um, the, the toolkit is fabulous. We really love that. So uh, appreciate everyone's support in, in our um, Illinois action plan as we begin implementation next month. Thank you. And uh, Nevada, any questions or remarks uh, for the panelists, things that resonated with you that you heard during the discussion? Sure. So um, um, I would start with a comment from Jen. And then before actually I start, thank you so much for all the comments. Um, we really do appreciate that. Um, we are really excited to have this plan ready to go. So thank you for the opportunity and all the comments and your support on this. Um, so going back to Jen's comment regarding the lifestyle coaches and um, also regarding the community health workers and whether we have a licensure or how we operate. So for lifestyle coaches, uh, we work with St. Rose Dominican Hospital um, where QTAC is uh, reside. And then uh, with QTAC, uh, we provide uh, train-the-trainer um, courses. And after they're done, uh, we do make sure that these those uh, coaches get um, opportunity to practice through uh, DSME or DPP that we implement. And most often what happens is uh, we use uh, community health workers to uh, go through these trainings so they can be deemed as like an expert in diabetes. And then within the state of Nevada, we do not have life insurance for community health workers, but we do offer uh, community health worker training, which is a hybrid eight weeks um, training. And then once they go through the training, they get um, kind of like graduation certificate, but it doesn't really have anything um, regarding like a life insurance per se. So that's something that we are uh, currently working with. Um, there's a conversation that's going around whether we should reimburse uh, services that's provided by uh, community health workers. And then we also done like um, a return on investment study with the universities, which showed a positive um, um, outcome on the cost effectiveness. So we'll see, um, I would say keep tuned for what, where we end up with this, uh, but uh, there are some activities already going on with that uh, uh, re related to community health workers. And then for Christine, uh, Kristen's comment regarding um, um, working with community, community organizations for reimburse, uh, uh, referrals and uh, getting feedback. And we are working on it and um, with a quality improvement organization to get the referral loop going. Um, there are, it, I feel like that activity is kind of like step by step, kind of like a little, um, little by little it's moving forward, but it's nowhere that where we can implement the referral loop to like a statewide um, uh, organization, but we are kind of like starting one by one at each organization and uh, see where the barriers are and then uh, see where the needs are and then addressing those needs right now. And then um, also working with um, kind of like uh, other partners to prevent obesity and diabetes. Uh, with our work uh, through nutrition unit at the state level, uh, there were some discussions regarding like targeting uh, postpartum uh, WIC clients to implement like DPP program and stuff like that. So there are some discussions. Um, I don't. We are not quite sure at this point where it's going to end, but there are those conversations. And then um, 
at least we have that relationship with them. So we are kind of like positive uh, that in the future something positive will happen. And then uh, thank you, Trish, for all the comments that you provided for us. Um, I just wanted to in touch with the role of GDPH um, in Nevada. Um, we do realize that we don't have all the capacity to implement the whole plan. The plan is so comprehensive, so we do have to work with our stakeholders. And then um, especially within diabetes, we are uh, working closely with QTAC as well as I do committee to move the needle on many policies and then uh, implementing interventions. So state, uh, in terms of the role for the state, we would be someone who would support our stakeholders to bring in together and then um, kind of like create the plan. But then we are hoping that the stakeholders can take on roles to do the actual implementation. So that would be something that we're going to have a discussion during the state engagement meeting in February. So we're really, really looking forward to that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have just a couple more minutes in this uh, section before we move forward. I don't see any questions um, in the chat box. Um, there was one comment that did get answered earlier, and um, I'll just reiterate that in case anyone else is wondering. Um, but, Pat, I saw that you had promoted um, another webinar that's coming up that might be beneficial for this audience. Could you share um, those details with us? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think someone had asked a question about becoming a Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program um, supplier, which I know is not the focus of our, our discussion here this afternoon, but if folks are interested, um, there is a webinar this Wednesday afternoon uh, that CMS is sponsoring, will be on as well. Um, it, it provides a general orientation to the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program as well as it's really geared for organizations who are interested in becoming MDPP suppliers um, and, and kind of gives them guidance on, on what they should be doing. There was a blast email that went out to all of the state health departments with the information on connecting to the registering for the webinar, but if anybody needs it, um, I'd be happy to share that. Great, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that information. I'm happy to get those resources out um, to this group. Well, um, unless there are any other uh, remarks, I think we can move forward and be a little bit um, ahead of schedule. I'll turn it over uh, to Asi now to um, hand it off, and we can discuss some of our diabetes resources and, and then adjourn. Asi? Thank you, Alicia. Um, so today we also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight um, some of our diabetes resources. And all these resources that I am about to highlight are available on our Astro Diabetes webpage. And um, the links are also included in this slide that you're currently viewing. So please feel free to just click on them and um, check out the resources. And they will also be included in the post-webinar recording note. So first we have um, the multi-level case studies are North Dakota and Oregon. And the case studies um, document how broad systems initiatives are translated, implemented, and measured across the state to the local communities. Um, we also have a key findings document um, that looks at ways the state health agencies can support diabetes prevention and control initiatives. And um, the document was informed by an advisory roundtable that ASTO hosted in August 2016. And um, they had, we had 17 partners and eight ASTO staff. And the goal was to gain input on strategies for um, key systems change levers to influence diabetes at the state level. And then we also have a diabetes toolkit on the website. And it is a compilation of tools and resources from states, national organizations, and federal agencies to drive the work of um, states and territories toward reducing the burden of diabetes. 
Um, so like I said, all of these are available on the website, and we will make sure to share um, the links with you all in the post-meeting notes. So that brings us to the end of this call. Um, we would like to thank and congratulate Illinois and um, Nevada for their uh, diabetes action plans um, and also for their great presentation. And we would also like to thank um, our panelists for their valuable insights and contributions to the discussion. Um, and last but not least, we'd like to thank um, the participants for joining today's webinar. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact the ASTO team. And um, that was it for today. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.